everybody. Raul here for Bass Musician Magazine, and today we have the great honor and pleasure of talking with bassist ilustre Ruben Rodriguez. <laughs> Gracias por esa intro, Raul. <laughs> Yay, a la orden. <laughs> so we've been trying to actually sit down and talk for the longest time. Ruben and I, we've been like every NAM would go by and we'd go, you know, this year we're going to do it. And this year we're going to do it. Now we're finally talking. So I'm really excited to have this opportunity. Ruben has a list of people that he has played with like a mile long. And so many of them were groups or musicians that I enjoyed back in the day and growing up. And they were iconic at those times, and we certainly want to learn a little of some of that history. So let's go way back to the back. How did you get started in music and on bass? Well, hello, everyone. Okay, so my father plays guitar. Okay. See, my father plays classical guitar, so there's always been a guitar in the house, you know, from before I was born. Basically, that you know, I got I got into that. You know, I learned a couple of chords, the block chords and stuff, mm -hmm. you know. And basically, just took it from there. Then later on, maybe I was in the maybe in uh, six or seven years old, uh, my grandma, who she sent boxes of stuff over, <laughs> we spoke earlier, Yeah. and one of those boxes, she sent a trumpet that my father had brought from my uncle. But wow. then my uncle, you know, he, he I, don't know, I don't know the story goes, if he was drafted or went into Vietnam, you know. Uh, he, came, he came out of that, a little bit of a mess, he died a few years later. But anyway, so he didn't play, he wasn't playing the trumpet. So she sent it over. And uh, and while that that was while I was living in Puerto Rico. Mm -hmm. We found a teacher, or maybe you might know, there was an old gentleman my father found in, in Calle, mm -hmm. right off the town center. And this, you know, it was a trumpet place. So he became my trumpet teacher. I, I studied with him for a while. I can't remember the situation exactly, but my father didn't take me to one lesson. You know, I don't know if he, you know, it was a financial thing or whatnot. Yeah. But this guy came looking for us, and he found us. He came, he said, man, what happened? You know, he's, he he was a cool dude like that. Nice. You know, he was a, uh, you know, so, and then I, I did that for a while, and, you know, we moved back to, to New York. I was, you know, I was born and raised here in New York mm -hmm. City. When I got into fourth grade, there, you know, there were no music no, no music programs in, in, uh, in the school where I was at. Then they transferred me, the next year to the fifth grade, they transferred me to a school half a block away, and I had I had a little music program there, so I was, you know, learning some band instruments. I was still undecided. But then when I got into junior high school, that's when I met the bass. Mm. You know, and I mean, I, mean, I, had been, I, you know, I had still been playing around the house, you know, a, little, you know, a couple of things here and there. By that time, my, my little sister was taking piano lessons. That didn't, that didn't go too well, but yeah. my father bought a piano. Yeah. So I was messing with the piano, yeah. you know, I, I messing around with the, with the piano a little bit. I got into junior high school band, 1976 or 77, something like that, and I, and I met the bass. You know, it was the acoustic bass at first, but then in January of the following year, the school got a bass guitar. Mm. And I said, ah, I think I can get into this. And I used to practice with the band. Uh, whatever songs we were learning, we were practicing. I remember uh, Gloria Gaynor was, uh, yeah. I Will Survive was popular at the yeah. time. Yeah. Evelyn Champagne King, Shane, and then there was a, a bunch of salsa tunes that the teacher used to bring in. So I used to I used to practice all that stuff. Listen to you know all, some of that stuff we played on the radio, of course, it was top forty. And then I would I would at home I would practice with the with the guitar. You know the the last four strings of the guitar. I would practice the bass lines to mm -hmm. the, to those uh, to those records. You know and, and the radio. Very cool. I, I just I just kept it from there. You know. And so did you pursue any additional education in music after that? <laughs> I got a little joke about that. I, well, I tell guys that I went to UCLA. <laughs> University corner on Lexington Avenue. <laughs> that was around the corner from where I lived. Yeah. And that's what I learned in the streets. Mm -hmm. I had a private teacher, Victor Renegas, who was from Chicago originally. He joined Mongo's band. Or Mongo actually recruited the band that he was in, in Chicago, to become his backup band. Mm -hmm. And that's what became the Mongo Santa Maria group in the early 60s. So Victor Renegas was, was the original bass player in that, in that group. And uh, I studied with him. He was teaching uh, in, in, uh, in a local neighborhood uh, music school, the Johnny Colon Music School. Johnny Colon was a piano player, trombone player from the era, from the yeah. Boogaloo days. Yeah. You know, still around. And I did my first gig with him a, a, a year or two later after, stu after starting uh, study with Victor at the school. Yeah. 
it's interesting because the whole phenomena, as, as, as you refer to it, salsa, I know it as salsa. A lot of people in the States refer to it as Latin jazz because it's, it's right. very unique and different than mm -hmm. the, I'll call it African-American jazz that you might have been hearing right. from, you know, Reggie Workman or Monk or, or all this yeah. stuff. But it had a, a very unique blending, especially that whole New York scene, because you had this Latin structure, but mm -hmm. a lot of times it also brought in non-Latin musicians. And right. so, especially when we, I, we used to listen to uh, Las Estrellas de Fania, the, the, at Live right. at the Cheetah, and right. all of us had learned the names in, in La Descarga of who it was, and so it was, you know, Ray Barreto on conga, but then Larry Harlow over here on piano. Yeah, <laughs> on yeah. piano. And, you know, it was a, a blend of musicians that had skills. Mm -hmm. And then you add in the presence of like Juilliard and stuff. And then you've got like Richie Ray and Bobby Cruz that right. all of a sudden are starting to introduce classical music into salsa. And right. it's just, it, was, it was just kind of this interesting melding of the cultures and the music styles, and you played with a huge amount of, of these people. Tell us a little bit, how did you get into the whole salsa scene? In large part to Victor Venegas, because he, you know, he, I would study with him, and, and he, I guess he would see progress, and he would start recommending me to groups. Mm -hmm. And stuff like that, send me on rehearsals. He couldn't do a rehearsal because of a lot of things other, so he sent me. <laughs> and me, I was, I was grateful just, you know, to, to be considered to, you know, to, to cover yeah. for him, you know? just so I could get experience. Because, I, you know, even at an early age, I understood that this this is all going to work in my benefit. Mm -hmm. you know? It may not pay off right now, but it's going to pay off eventually. Well, And, you know, through one of those things, I got into, you know, uh, I, uh, maybe about a year or so past, and Victor started sending me to gigs. And one of the gigs he sent me to was a Machito gig, who is... Basically, the the father of uh, and godfather, well, Mario Alcide Machito, the father and godfather of uh, of what is known today as Latin jazz, because mm. uh, you know they they were had a band, they were running a band in the forties. Remember, before jazz was called jazz, it was it was swing, yeah, it was dance music, and that's what you know the big bands, you know, uh, Duke Ellington, Basie, you know, they, they were playing swing, dance music, Cat Calloway. And all these guys were doing the same gigs, Machito and them, and, and those guys that I just mentioned, they were all on the same gigs often, in the same clubs, Birdland. Mm -hmm. So they, they all knew each other. And they're like, for instance, Mario Walsa uh, worked with Cap Calloway. He was his musical director. He worked with Chick Webb, you know, was his musical director. Chick Webb was a drummer, so he had a big man in the era. And, I mean, there's a story around that goes, and, and this Mario told me this himself. Other people say different, but, you know, Whatever I know, that, you know, it's been so many years. Uh, uh, stories is going to change. But Mario told me that he saw he, he saw a young girl once at the Apollo, and he mm -hmm. recommended her to Chick Webb, who he was directing at the time. So she came in the band and sang. And she recorded her first hit with that band, which was a tisket, a tasket. Oh wow! That young lady was Ella Fitzgerald. <laughs> oh wow! All right. So that that whole scene, they were all all you know maybe they weren't really playing together. In, in, a, in a single unit as of yet, mm -hmm. but that came from there, from that association. And then Chano Poso gets in the mix, you know, Cuban drummer and composer gets in the mix, and he he gets with Dizzy Gillespie, and they create a sound, you know, and that that would become what they call Latin jazz, you know, uh, which is uh, basically the the Latin element in the orchestra and yeah. the rhythm, the rhythm, mm -hmm. and with the jazz solos on top, you yeah. Know? Well, and it had the elements for, for people that haven't experimented. You had a whole percussive, very heavy Afro-Antillian percussion component, right. usually conga, timbale, bongo, or, or minor right. percussion. It could be clave yeah. or, or, or right. guiro, oh, yeah. uh, maracas. You, know, right. all, you had a whole section there. And then you had your horns. And it was, you know, I remember trumpet players... A lot of times you could find good trumpet players. Good trombone players were hard to find. And like when Willie Colon came along, all of a sudden a lot of people wanted to try to play trombone and did not do it <laughs> quite as, as well as, as Willie could. Yeah, yeah. And uh, 
then you would have uh, usually a, a vocalist and and a couple of people maybe doing like the the chorus because right. with with right. the structure and so much of the salsa you'll have like the main uh lines but you'll have a very singable rememberable chorus and it's right. the part the that the hook yeah the hook and that's what i always remembered was able to sing and so as at, at the same time that you were going back and forth i'm being introduced into puerto rico i'm learning spanish but yeah. i could remember the the corito and so i could pitch in <laughs> and, right, yeah. and sing well, that that's the key to success in any song absolutely half the hook where the average listener is going to get attracted to the song and and then you have a possible hit mm -hmm. you know it's like talking about trumpet players this is one guy when i was growing up that he played one note on the trumpet and you knew even i knew and i was i wasn't even into music yet and i knew who that was because yeah. he used to have records at the house everybody knew it was herb Alpert. oh yeah and the tijuana brass where he played a note boom you know that, that it was him mm -hmm. and a lot of guys a lot of the baddest jazz cats couldn't didn't do that they were great instrumentalists great players and superb improvisers and stuff but as far as the sound yeah it, it, very few had it very few had that gift absolutely and another another component that made salsa so popular and you mentioned the dance clubs that it was very right. dancing it was dance music okay. yeah and it was what was very much expected, I remembered, especially because I was a musician, most of us only learned a little step from one side to the other side. You didn't have to do anything fancy. You know, right. it wasn't Mike, it wasn't the Jackson 5 or anything. It was just, a, you know, okay, I, right. I yeah. can move this. And when I was in the, in the crowd, I'd feel a little uncomfortable because you'd see these people that would dedicate, oh, I'm sure they had to practice hours. And it was usually at like a fiesta patronale or something. They're they're there and they're twirling and they're doing these like tricks and you're like, whoa. So it 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 had this internalization of the music and the way you felt. And of course, bass players, you know, weren't usually at the front. I think there's the, the kind of the unsung heroes. I mean, there were a few, maybe like a Oscar de Leon or Bobby Valentin or some that People went, oh, I, rec I recognize them. Yeah. But there was so much bass, and it was so characteristic. I mean, just it was, it was something that I think if you were exposed to it, you'd catch it. Kind of the syncopated nature mm -hmm. on, on how you land in your place in the music where like rock people are kind of like, it's all more kind of bang, 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 bang straight on, on, on the one there. But salsa had such... A, a, a wonderfully unique characteristic. And again, it was this flux between New York and Puerto Rico right. that was contributing to that, that blending. Oh, definitely. And the thing with the dancing, okay, well, when I was growing up, my generation had to dance in, ho in the house parties. Yeah. There was no, nobody went to no Arthur Murray dance school. <laughs> or no, 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 nobody did that. They do that now. <laughs> You know, and not, you know, to me, sometimes, you know, I can't even watch people dance <laughs> now because it may just throw me off cloudy. Yeah. You know, so I just concentrate on, or if I see a couple that knows how to dance, then I vibe off for them. Yeah. You know, because, you know, that's that basically, man, that's, that's our fuel. If, 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 if you know, playing this music, if, if I see people dancing, yeah, I'm going to get into it. Mm -hmm. But if I see them dancing all squared and shit, yeah. you know. <laughs> I'm going to go just turn on, I'm, you know, I go look the other way, you know, or just concentrate on, or, you know, then I got to concentrate on what I'm doing and I got to think and I don't like that. I like to just flow, you know, I like it to just flow, just play, you know. Gotcha. But yeah, dance parties is where a lot of cats from my generation, and I'm sure before, learn, learn, learn how to dance. Mm -hmm. And I think another key part that obviously you were in the right place at the right time when all of this stuff was happening, but you also had to have the right attitude. And, mm -hmm. and that is one of the things that, I mean, there's a couple of people out of New York that have written books on how to be a bass player in New York. And some of the very simple things is like, you know, show up on time, have mm -hmm. dependable gear, mm -hmm. you know. A clean shirt. Oh, don't, and, and you know, don't be, don't be a terrible, you know, have this attitude like, you know, I'm the right. prima donna and I've, I've, I've been here because you have to be somebody that people like to work with. 
And right. once you can get your foot in the door, like with one group, and they go, well, this guy, he's good to work with, so we'll do this side project. Or, you know, you sit in for somebody and they go, well, hey, this, this is great. And right. you went through the times, I mean, disco was very danceable music, but for bass players and a lot of musicians, it was like the kiss of death. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, that can happen in any scene, really. Oh, yeah. You know, the, at least disco. I, I mean, I, I used to enjoy it when I was a kid because, I, you know, I can dance to it, too. Yeah, you know, yeah. But, and, and, and I would sit down and actually play along with, the, with those records. Mm -hmm. that's, that was on the radio all the time, so I used to play along with the radio. Now, you know, at least they, they had a live instruments. Yeah. You know, musicians play live instruments. Now you can't get that. Now everything is computer. Yeah. It's a knucklehead sitting behind pressing buttons. <laughs> so the new generation's got it 10 times worse than we had it. <laughs> Absolutely. You know? the, the unfortunate part of it is, is, I think, is that money is doing the talking with that as well. So what it used to take for you to put on a live performance and have mm -hmm. all these people in logistics, especially with a band that's playing salsa, you yeah. needed to have enough individuals that were dependable and you know could work together and didn't have the terrible right. attitudes and you know the the group I was playing with back in that day we were a big group and so if somebody had an issue or somebody was not dependable they could be very talented and as a matter of fact right. we had some very talented people yeah. that because of like a not a great attitude you know they had to go <laughs> Right, yeah. because no, I remember, you know, hey, listen, when I was coming up, also, they, like when I started on the jingle scene mm -hmm. in New York, maybe mid 80s, when there was still a jingle scene, not anymore. Yeah. But I saw guys that I saw, like, at the, you know, I used to get there 20, 15, 20 minutes before the hit, you know, set up, chill out, drink a zip of water or coffee or whatever. Yeah. And be in my chair at 5 2. It was 10, you know, those calls were 10 a.m. calls mostly, all of them, 10 a.m. And I saw a couple of times, man, where there was a couple of empty chairs at 10.01. <laughs> and by 10.04, they were filled. Oh. You know, like, if somebody didn't show up, it, you know, it took two, three minutes to get somebody in the chair. Yeah. So that you can get to business, you know? Get down to business. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I know the professionalism. Yeah. That's the, that's, the, that's the one thing that I learned early on, thanks to guys like Machito and Tito Puente, who the old the old school cats. And they instilled that in me, you know, like they used to, I remember one time my, my first tour with Machito to Europe, the lobby call, let's say it was uh, 10 a.m. I, I was there at 9.45 and he yelled at me because he thought I was late. Oh, wow. Because he had been there an hour already, you know, and uh, some of the other guys were there hanging out, you know, half hour before and stuff. I got there 15 minutes before. And, and, and he kind of yelled at me. So, you know, I learned my lesson from those guys. Mm -hmm. I was still a teenager. You know, Puente the same way. I, I always thanked him for... Uh, Machito, I didn't, I didn't get to thank. He died before I was able to. But with Tito, I, I worked with him plenty of times. My first time was in 82. So he died in 2000. A couple of days before he left to Puerto Rico. And the day before he left to Puerto Rico, we played, I played with him here in, some, in a show at Town Hall. Wow. And I remember telling him, uh, I remember thanking him, like a, like a couple of the other guys, man, for giving the kid a break. Because, he, man, he, he drilled into me the first couple of gigs I did with him. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, I, I wasn't playing the right stuff. And I was playing what was in the paper, but it, but it was not what was on the record. You dig? Yeah. Thanks to Bobby Rodriguez, who's another idol of mine. He used to just come up with stuff on the fly. You know, because that's all those records recorded in the fifties, sixties, when they were just, when the whole band was playing together. Yeah. So he cut with stuff off on the fly, and that wasn't on the paper, but it was on the recording and working. That's what Tito wanted to hear. So it made me go out and study the music, buy the music, and study it. So all those guys, you know, a large part of my career. You know. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. And was there any particular group that you played with? That as you as you look back, that you felt was maybe the most challenging. What was the the hardest gig that you that you ever had to do? That's easy. That's an easy answer. Roberta Flack. Oh wow! Because it was mostly ballads, where you got to play the right notes always, and you got to put them in the right place. <laughs> you know what I mean? You know, every once in a while we did an up tempo R and B tune, but yeah. you know she was 
basically known for that, the balance. And you had to like lay it down, make a nice bed for her. Yeah. Thing, you know, we keep the pocket. And I had the pleasure of having Buddy Williams as a drummer for most of the time that I was there. Mm-hmm. He was like, he's like one of the top New York studio aces. He made the gig real easy to do, real easy. And, uh, and so it, it, without a doubt, that was, that was one of the most challenging gigs that, I, that I've ever done. Who would have thought, right? Yep. <laughs> and as everybody in the bass world likes to think about gear, how are you getting your sound? What are you playing on? I still have my old Fenders. I don't take them out as much. My old Fender jazz basses and a couple of P basses. Mm-hmm. But I've been using um, Roger Sadowski basses. Sadowski's an old friend of mine from 35 plus years now. You know, so I'm playing one of I have two, a four string and a five string that I've been playing. Nice. Mainly. I'm using his strings. I was looking around for some new strings and stuff and, and experimenting every once in a while. I, but, you know, but mostly I go back to the old stuff. I use Roger's. And maybe, you know, I'll buy a set of uh, the Adarios or something, you know, like if I want the flat mounds and stuff. Mm-hmm. And then, I, you know, I also play upright. So I'm, I'm experimenting with different strings now for the upright, too. Gotcha. You know? I got some, I got, what did I get last on, uh, on this Colombian-made upright, like stick bass? I got some um, weed whackers. <laughs> the real light gauge, uh, extra light, light gauge uh, weed whacker strings. They're that, like the nylon fishing lines. Mm-hmm. And and they sound good on that bass for that for that for that kind of stuff that thump, yeah. For salsa, they sound good. But on my on my baby bass, I got steel strings. You know, I use steel strings on that. Yeah, and on the acoustic as gotcha. well. And amplification wise, you have a preference? Whatever they got, <laughs> whatever they got, where I'm go- wherever the gig is, whatever they got, I use. There you go. So, yeah, a beats carrying anything they got, beats carrying mm-hmm. mine. <laughs> you know, I mean, I have a few around. I have a few amplifiers around. You know, but. I don't have a preference. Got you. Well, that's an interesting characteristic that especially musicians out of New York City, mm-hmm. that is the big consideration. Do I want to schlep this up and down the stairs? <laughs> especially, you know, and we ain't getting no younger. That's right. No, man, look at all this great. No, nah, get out of here. You know? <laughs> so so you know, a lot of places you got to slip on, so I just take the smallest combo that I have. It's like a 40-watt, 50-watt combo. I don't, I don't know. I don't see it around here. Maybe I, oh no, I know where it is. I don't have it. <laughs> there you go. Well, I left it at the place where I was rehearsing. Yeah, weight <laughs> turns into a real consideration, and I, I'd yeah. say I'm really pleased that manufacturers have been taking that into account. And so more and more, you're seeing yeah. lighter cabs, smaller mm-hmm. heads. You right. know, you can get a uh, hundred watts out of something that'll fit in your gig bag now. Exactly. Yeah. So if I need any more than that. Then now we going direct yeah. to uh, to the PA or sound system or whatever, and you know oftentimes I prefer that I just bring me in the monitor and and just roll down the highs and I'm good with that. I don't need to hear myself with a with a refri- one of those refrigerator apps. You know, like <laughs> well, but back in my day I used to carry the the gear for the group a lot of the times. I, I always oh, liked to go in the gear van because there was more room. It was just a little easier. So I'm well acquainted with the weight of the Ampeg. And yeah. the the Shure PA system was like had two coffins. Oh, I Those remember that. Yeah. <laughs> speakers were huge. When I started, I used to from my house on 101st Street and First Avenue, go to the train on 103rd and Lexington. That was about seven blocks. Oh man! Right, seven blocks with an Ampeg B15 oh. and a bass guitar. Okay, the B, the B15 had wheels, so I would it, drag it most of the way, but it weighed 75 pounds, and I had to take it down the stairs of the train, <laughs> into the train, then either. Go up the stairs when I get to to, to where I'm going. Mm-hmm. Or sometimes I play in Brooklyn from the elevator train, come down the stairs with the amp. You know, uh, I can't do that now. Yeah. I don't want to do that now. You know, yeah. so I still love to play my bass. Absolutely. Well, and the thing is, both with the instruments and amplification, weight. The older we get, it turns into a real consideration. Yeah. And okay. you've got people like Roger that has been really finessing, you know, some of the things that some of the, a lot of his basses, I, I talked to somebody that he described these instruments as fender like objects that to look at them, you'd go, well, that looks like a fender, but he has done a lot of the things that have made it that much better. And with his right. electronics, the, those, yeah. you know, preamp and, and again, you've got the strings. I remember I had a chance to talk with Chuck Rainey, 
Oh, yes. And he's playing an exotic fender-like object. Right. And yeah. that thing weighs yeah. in at eight pounds. And right. so when I ask him, why do you like this one? He's like, because it's light. Light is, is the way to go. <laughs> I, my five string, I don't have. I have my four string here. My, my Sadowski five string is about that yeah. weight, uh, eight and cha- eight short change. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and the whole myth of you need more weight for resonance. I mean, you know, I I remember picking up some of these Thunderbirds are made out of mahogany. These things are like fourteen pounds. Wow, and man, you, I remember some of those. <laughs> you kind of go, wow, that that is that is a lot. It's okay if you're eighteen. Right, but not when you're 57. Nope. There, there you go. <laughs> well, Ruben, and looking ahead, I know we're, we're chatting in times of the pandemic, so there's a lot of uncertainty right, with, right. with musicians, but what are you working on? What plans do you have for the future? These times, man, challenging, to say the very least. I don't know, man. You know, uh, getting this, this stuff together, like right now, this Skype together, you know, to uh, maybe even give lessons, you know, do the, do the, the educational thing. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm, I'm learning, like I said, like I told you earlier, to record from the house because I still get calls for sessions, you know. Yeah. Uh, the only thing is you don't do, you're not doing re- whole records anymore. Everything is one song here, one song there, you know. But that's, you know, sign of the times. It's been that, it's been that way for a while already, pre- yeah. way pre-pandemic. Yo, like you know, we're getting old, you know, I'm getting older, so I'm chilling out too. You there know, you go. I'm getting mellow work with age. Very so. nice. Well, Ruben, it's been so great to catch up. Well, folks, you've seen him here. <laughs> Ruben Rodriguez coming to you on Bass Musician Magazine. All right now. Coño Raul, thanks for the invite, man. I'm glad that we uh, we made it work. <laughs> you got it, man. <laughs>